Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Retina Roundup. I am Dr. Sanket Patel, fellow in Vitio Retina and Ocular Oncology and I am going to take you through this month's top 5 articles. Let's start with the first article which studied that macular hole closure can be achieved without the use of endotamponade with similar closure rates as gas endotamponade. In this study, the patients underwent the technique of formation of viscoelastic assisted temporal internal limiting membrane flap without any gas endotamponade. Pre-operative and post-operative visual acuity and foveal structure in optical coherence tomography images were evaluated. Macular hole closure was achieved with a single procedure in 11 of 12 eyes with no endotamponade application. It was found that this technique avoids the application of any tamponade, does not require positioning, and seems to provide macular hole closure rates similar to those of traditional vitrectomy with gas. Moving on to the second study, which was based on four-year visual outcomes in the protocol W randomized trial of intravitreal aflibercept for prevention of vision-threatening complications of diabetic retinopathy. The objective of this study was to compare the primary four-year outcomes of visual acuity and rates of vision-threatening complications in eyes with moderate to severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy with non-center involving diabetic macular edema treated with injection intravitreal aflibercept versus sham. It was found that among patients with NPDR without center involving diabetic macular edema, at four-year treatment with aflibercept versus sham, initiating aflibercept treatment only if vision-threatening complications developed resulted in statistically significant anatomical improvement, but no visual acuity improvement. Aflibercept as a preventive strategy as used in this trial may not be generally warranted for patients with NPDR without center involving diabetic macular edema. Coming to the third study, the purpose of this study was to evaluate long-term effect of SARS-CoV-2 infection on the retinal and choroidal microvasculature. The case control prospective study was carried out among 49 patients with COVID-19 with bilateral pneumonia and 45 healthy age and gender matched individuals significantly decreased vessel density in the superficial capillary plexus, the deep capillary plexus and choriocapillaries was noted along with significant increase in vessel density was observed in the choriocapillaries of the foveal area. The foveal avascular zone was significantly increased in the COVID-19 group. In conclusion, it was noticed that persistent changes in the ocular parameters of OCT angiography in COVID-19 patients. At the second follow-up visit, it was observed that widened foveal avascular zone in the superficial capillary plexus and decreased vessel density in some regions of retina and choroid. Moving on to the fourth article, which is a single center prospective pilot study conducted to evaluate photobio modulation therapy for large soft drusen and drusenoid pigment epithelial detachment in age-related macular degeneration. It was found that the best corrected visual acuity significantly improved at the sixth month with a mean score gain of 5.5 letters. The retinal sensitivity decreased by 0.1 decibels. Mean fixation stability increased by 0.45%. This article stated that photobiomodulation may provide a valid therapeutic option for large soft drusens or drusenoid PED in age-related macular degeneration and may potentially slow the natural course of the disease. Heading towards the last study, which describes the management and outcomes of posterior persistent fetal vasculature. Anatomical results ocular hypertension, best corrected visual acuity, presence of post-operative adverse events and additional surgical interventions were recorded in this study. 
Posterior persistent fetal vasculature was associated with anterior involvement in 64% eyes. 42.7% eyes were microophthalmic and were more frequently associated with the severe form of persistent fetal vasculature. Surgery was performed in 85 patients and the goals of the surgery included achieving retinal flattening, reduction of vitreoretinal traction, freeing of the visual axis and aesthetic concerns. Out of the patients that underwent surgery, 81% the surgery was a total success, 6% it was a partial success due to persistent limited peripheral retinal detachment, and 13% were a failure due to persistent total retinal detachment after surgery. 24 eyes presented with post-operative adverse effects including ocular hypertension requiring eye drop medication in 6.6%, secondary cell proliferation around the IOL in 7.7%, intravitreal hemorrhages in 6.6% .6 patients, persistent tractional retinal detachment in 9.9% .9 patients. A second surgery was performed in 16% patients. In this case series, most of the patients presenting with persistent fetal vasculature with posterior involvement required complex vitreoretinal surgeries. Uh, this brings us to the end of the articles. Um, thank you so much.